I'm greatly privi privileged to, uh, to be moderating this, um, this panel, um, the last panel of discussion today. Um, it's going to be, I would like to take this as a very open uh, discussion opportunity, um, not only to talk about um, what we hope to do and achieve as members of the SAGES group, but there were a lot of good, excellent suggestions made in the previous two uh, panels uh, that we can take into account of. Um, there may be some aspects of certain aspects of North Korean human rights that, um, that we feel passionate about that we can uh, elaborate uh, a little further. The, you know, what, what, it, what it has meant uh, for the COI in the past two years and what can we look forward to uh, in the years to come, uh, especially on the uh, accountability, how we take the anniversary of the OHCHR sole office um, and any suggestions um, as, as we move forward. So it's going to be a very general take um, on, on the, on the on the discussions that we've already had uh, earlier this morning, uh, as well as these general broader topic, including uh, the SAGES group. So I will give each uh, panelists about, I don't know, five, six minutes or so, um, and then we can just circle around. Uh, we will also give some opportunity for the audience to raise some questions uh, or make some comments, and then Finally, probably at, ab at about 4.45, um, I will, there is a um, prepared recommendations uh, that the SAGES group is making. It's a general recommendations, a uh, good number of them, which I will read off um, towards the end of this, uh, end of this panel. So uh, with that said, let me first turn to, turn to, um, Professor Song. Um, thank you, Ambassador Lee. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I do not think that there is any uh, further uh, things to add to this keynote speech I delivered this morning. Uh, <coughs> but I, I would like to begin by uh, emphasizing that the it is very, very, very timely and appropriate to launch the SAGES group uh, for the North Korean human right. And further that um, the launching this particular group is, in my view, one of the uh, efficient and effective ways of keeping the momentum for the North Korean human rights issue alive uh, in the international community. Um, probably uh, we would, uh, in due course, uh, would uh, discuss and find the different ways of uh, keeping this momentum alive. Uh, this is very, since this is very important. Um, that's uh, one. Uh, uh, that's the beginning, and um, I, taking this opportunity, I would like to uh, elaborate a little bit of the ICC referral uh, because this this uh, issue uh, was raised. Uh, by me as well as uh, along the uh, in the two previous uh, panel discussions. Uh, I don't uh, want to create any excessive expectation about the ICC uh, referral. Uh, the we have to sort of manage. Uh, expectation and along that line. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. You know, the, uh, the, the I International Criminal Court 
is literally the last resort, the last safety net for our international justice. If any other means and, uh, are, are, were available, then we should, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very logical to, to uh, take all those other options before you uh, just bring the, uh, the, the whole entire issues to the International Criminal Court. You see, the <coughs> international criminal justice is neither cheap nor fast. This is very expensive, very time-consuming justice. Um, <coughs> you may be surprised to hear me say so, but let me just reveal one tiny bit of uh, reason for this. In the case of the UN ad hoc tribunals, especially at the ICTY, the language issue is limited to uh, uh, just the three languages that are spoken in that uh, uh, the designated area, Serbian, Croatian, or Bosnian, and uh, so on. That's it. But the language issue for the ICC is completely open-ended, depending upon the what kind of uh, accused, what kind of witnesses you have to deal with. If, for example, any accused or uh, witness speaks a certain obscure ethnic language that is spoken by as few as uh, 50,000 people in the remote, the remote the village in the, uh, in the vast African continent. Now, the, the ICC criminal proceeding has to be conducted in that particular language all throughout because this is a matter of the accused the basic human right. The, the trial should be conducted in the, in the language the accused uh, you know, understands best. That's the uh, treaty requirement. So what would you do if you just run into that kind of uh, the linguistic difficulty? That uh, example, small example alone, you know, gives you enough uh, sort of uh, <coughs> uh, impression as to how the international criminal justice achieved by the uh, uh, or in the ICC would be time consuming and uh, expensive and, and so on. So the ICC, referral to the ICC should be the last resort. See, uh, that's the point I want to emphasize. The <coughs> you see, the, as you all know, uh, the IC, some years ago, ICC uh, sort of planned or attempted to uh, to deal with uh, North Korean issues by themselves. Um, it's, uh, uh, at the uh, prosecutor's initiative, the ICC issue <coughs> uh, was uh, subject to the, uh, the preliminary examination. I'm uh, carefully choosing the terminology of the treaties, examination as opposed to the in actual investigation. The subject to uh, the preliminary examination about North Korean uh, human rights issue. And then subsequently, they uh, uh, end up uh, having to deal with uh, the Navy ship sinking and the, uh, the Yeonpyeongdo shelling, uh, which resulted in uh, the two innocent civilian killings. Uh, <coughs> in my personal view, the handling of the issue by the uh, OTP of the ICC was less than professional. They should have 
solicited lots of uh, cooperation, expertise, and uh, other uh, you know collaboration with the uh, the North Korea Human Rights uh, 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 specialized NGOs and civil society. I mean, in that particular respect, the OTP of the ICC didn't do their best, in my view. Uh, if that uh, similar uh, occasion would ever take place in the ICC, i.e. the ICC would ever uh, uh, have to deal with North Korean issue by themselves in the, in the ICC, then the, in my view, the first thing they should do is to sincerely seek, diligently seek the expertise of the other NGO or sp uh, the North Korean human rights specialized NGOs and civil society. Um, <coughs> so, the in when I s said it was uh, impossible, legally impossible, to uh, prosecute uh, North Korean leader uh, before the ICC in my keynote speech. Um, of course, there are some reasons for that, and you know them all. Uh, of course, uh, the, the first, the most obvious reason was that uh, North Korea is not a state party to the Rome Statute. They will never be. <coughs> That's so the ICC jurisdiction cannot be extended to uh, North Korea. And uh, the second reason was the ICC operates on the principle of non retroactivity there this means the any icc crimes that uh, that took place prior to july 1st 2002 are not subject to the icc jurisdiction um so uh, i'm not saying that um, ICC referral, ICC prosecution of North Korean human rights violations is not uh, legally possible, but I'm saying that uh, you have to uh, very exequently and uh, carefully package the whole issue before you submit the whole thing to the ICC. You see, careful legal, uh, you know, ingenuity is required there. Oftentimes, when I uh, work there, oftentimes lots of individuals, uh, human rights conscious individuals, mainly lawyers or other uh, organizations, associations, um, bar associations, they all came to, uh, the, uh, to the ICC in The Hague and just uh, submitted their petition uh, or complaints to the uh, OTP of the ICC and then turn around and just, uh, you know, just uh, meet the, uh, met the press and uh, told the press uh, what they had done. But you see, the, if you look at the uh, Rome statute, who, sh who, who are eligible or allowed to file the complaint? Not the individual, nor the any uh, association or, or, or organizations. It is the 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 the, uh, the treaty wording is a state, so the government, only the government, can bring the complaints to the uh, to the uh, OTP. No individual action is legally valid. So please bear that in mind and uh, save your time and energy for not doing uh, that frivolous uh, exercise. Um, <laughs> so um, I, can, uh, I can go on and on, uh, but uh, the, my, one of my friends who happens to be a fortune teller, 
predicted the sudden downfall of North Korean regime will take place in, in the year 2021, <laughs> five years from now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke, but you see, the <clears throat> I know this government in, uh, in the Republic of Korea does have the Ministry of uh, Unification. And um, not only that particular ministry, but also uh, Ministry of Justice and uh, even the, the Supreme Court and other relevant organizations uh, uh, have been rather in competition to learn the lessons from the German un uh, uh, unification uh, to find some wisdom applicable later to the uh, Korean unification situation. Good, oh, uh, good for that. Um, but one, uh, one thing that is lacking in this uh, government um, effort or exercise is that how to prepare our judicial systems, meaning the court judiciary, the prosecution and police, and or even the uh, certain uh, section segment of the Korean military, how to prepare Korean judicial system in the case of uh, you know, such, a, uh, such an occurrence, mm -hmm. you know, you see, they, uh, the government, uh, all the ministries, uh, relevant ministries of the Korean government seem to have been working quite seriously to prepare themselves for the, uh, for that mm -hmm. kind of situation. But uh, more specifically, how to prepare the this uh, uh, judicial authorities? I mean, uh, national legal systems uh, for that uh, uh, in, in the in the case of say sudden downfall of North Korean regime. And perhaps maybe we we can come back to that yeah. point. This uh, is yeah. this is the mo mm. last point I want to raise. Mm. So I'll mm. stop here. Okay. So I think um, President Song is certainly. Um, explaining the necessity for the prosecutory mechanism to kick in. Uh, but having said that, the difficulties uh, involved uh, in not only at the not only at the Security Council because because of the abusive power. Even if it's not the Security Council um, petitioning for ICC uh, action is, um, is not as easy as uh, one, two, three, that this is something that has to be driven from a at state level rather than from an individual or uh, NGOs. Now, um, I will now turn to Justice Kirby who was taking, sitting next to me, and I saw that he was taking an inordinate amount of notes from panels one and two. Um, I hope you'll be able to <laughs> summarize some of that uh, in the next uh, seven, eight minutes. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to start by uh, paying a tribute to Ambassador Lee for all his highly professional uh, work, uh, scholarly work, uh, thoughtful work. Um, uh, the Republic of Korea is very well served by those who are its ambassadors. And what I liked most about their professionalism was that during the entire uh, discharge of the uh, mandate of the Commission of Inquiry on uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, uh, not one of them put a foot wrong. I can't say that that is a universal phenomenon in the United Nations because diplomats are paid to lie for their country and try to do the best they can for their uh, national interests. 
but uh, I'd like to single out also uh, Ambassador Choi, who was here today, uh, and Ambassador Ahn, uh, Ambassador of the ROK in Washington. They were scrupulous in not overstepping the mark. As a person who had been a judge in my own country for 34 years, I would have been very sensitive to that, and I wouldn't have liked it at all. And I never saw it happen once. And I think that is something uh, that the professionalism of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of this country can take pride in. Secondly, um, it's very important for the sages to acknowledge, both in words and in their attitudes and in their action, that they are no longer, in this respect, United Nations mandate holders. As it happens, I think Vitit still has mandates from the United Nations, and I have a mandate from the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, on the high-level panel on access to health technologies, which we'll be reporting soon. But in the North Korea uh, context, the context of DPRK, we don't have a mandate. And there is a symbolism in the fact that uh, Marzuki Dorisman, uh, still the special rapporteur, is sitting um, in the body of the hall. We are up here. We are, in this respect, exes. And we have to get that very clearly in our minds and at no stage ever overstep the mark. Uh, we have to learn um, and practice the professionalism of the ROK ambassadors um, and we have to respect uh, the independence of those who carry the mandate and not interfere in that mandate. Uh, they have the responsibility and they will have to discharge that responsibility as they think fit uh, without uh, a lot of exes going around trying to interfere in how they do it. Uh, and I, I would like to put that on the table as far as I'm concerned in the work of the, uh, man, of the, man, of the um, sages. Uh, that will be certainly the attitude that I will take and I'm sure my colleagues too. Thirdly, we have to be careful not to derogate by anything we do as sages from the neutrality that we adopted when we were mandate holders of the United Nations, because that would retrospectively damage the important work that we performed. Uh, and um, I believe it will be um, very important that uh, we should maintain an attitude of neutrality uh, and uh, an attitude, for example, uh, which I always took. I never s spoke, nor did any of my colleagues in the uh, Commission of Inquiry of the, uh, ever take an attitude of regime change. You can search everything that was ever said by the uh, Commission of Inquiry, and that was not on the agenda. Of course, we had submissions to that effect, and we had people saying it should be prepared for that effect, but we were officers of the United Nations, and that was not an option that was open to us, and it was something which uh, we did not take um, uh, or refer to or express in uh, the way in which we approached our task. Um, at the heart of the report of the COI, uh, was a paradox or a dilemma. And it was the paradox or dilemma of reconciling the two streams, as they were called earlier today, of uh, accountability for the great wrongs that were revealed in our inquiry and report, on the one hand, and promoting engagement um, because the people of North Korea um, thirst in their hearts, I believe, as do the people of uh, the Republic of Korea, to engage with each other and to be unified. Never forget, the Korean people never decided to divide this peninsula. This was not a decision of the people of Korea, North or South. 
this was something that was imposed upon them by uh, the shortly to be successful um, Allied powers at the Second World War. Uh, this is not an act of self-determination that the people of Korea ever engaged in, and it's very important that those who serve the United Nations should uh, constantly keep that in mind and respect uh, the integrity of the people of North Korea. Uh, fourthly, I think it's important that the sages, if we are to be useful uh, in uh, the exercise which is now given to us, should um, sometimes say things that are the friendly remarks that may be seen by some people as mildly critical of the Republic of Korea. I don't know how more gently I can put that, but uh, no country is perfect. In human rights, no country is perfect. Certainly my own country, Australia, is not perfect. We are constantly learning and striving and, I hope, improving ourselves. We got a little of a suggestion of this in some of the observations uh, that we heard today. For example, uh, Christine Chung, you'll remember, <clears throat> ever so carefully and diplomatically said that in respect of the representation of the um, refugees, the, the people who have come from North Korea seeking a new life in South Korea. They have not been utilised uh, or organised uh, in a way that they can speak as a group uh, in an effective manner. And that is a curiosity. Uh, and uh, that is something that it may be that the sages would like to uh, flesh, flesh out uh, from the remark of Christine Chung, which is certainly something that I've thought of. How can we mobilise and get the best use of the 30,000 people, citizens uh, in uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, so that we can the better reach out and, uh, and uh, work upon the second stream, engagement, which certainly in the mind of the uh, COI was... Uh, important alongside accountability. Another matter upon which th the sages may wish to make an observation, and I've made this observation many times, both publicly and privately. I think in a matter so existential as the future of the people of Korea, I'm talking about the people of all Korea, the ancient land of Korea. Uh, it would be helpful, useful, to have the participation of the uh, parliamentary opposition. Now, I've been to many functions, and I, I've, I've ha met one or two, but it's very rare. And this is a functioning democracy. This country changes its government, uh, and I think it is important that there should be an engagement with opposition as well as government, and with all streams of opinion in ROK, where at least you can have a different point of view and you're not taken out and shot. Uh, and therefore, uh, that's the sort of thing I th hope that the sages will speaking with their different viewpoints, and we won't all be unanimous, will uh, express to um, uh, the uh, Korean community. Now, it is true that I thought this conference would be more of the same. I thought this would be another conference where we say, we're very frustrated, we've put the report out, not enough has happened, and we want to know why, and we want to make sure that things improve. But I think the conference this morning was different. And uh, in fact, uh, as Ambassador Lears said, I've got two pages here of, of points 
that could in a sense be the agenda of the sages uh, that have been put forward. I won't read them all, there's not time, but just let me give you what I think are some very good points that came out today. These are the ones I've circled and there are about five times as many points. One of them is what can we learn from Myanmar, Burma, from the fact that 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 was the only other case where a human rights agenda issue got onto the, uh, onto the business paper of the Security Council of the United Nations of the world. Uh, and uh, the point was made, as you remember, by Jared Ganser today, that in some ways, though not as enduring, uh, the organized force of the military rule of Bur Burma, Myanmar, uh, was, uh, had parallels and similarities, and yet they appear to be on a road, if I can use that overworked and often disappointing word, road map, uh, they seem to be moving at least at the moment in the right direction. Now, what can we learn from that and how can we try to maximise that? Then there was the point of the young generation. You remember that one of the civil society participants said, well, what can we young people do? I think the answer to that is the young people should not ask us what they can do. They should get out and do it. And if there are impediments on their doing so, they should make that clear and seek to have those impediments lightened so that they can join together and uh, make um, steps uh, and point to the future. Another point that was made uh, was humanitarian assistance, uh, that that must be continued at all time. I think that's something that should be uh, on our agenda. Uh, Greg Scarletio's uh, point about combating the cancer of long-term human rights uh, deprivations. Uh, wh what happens after a very long time of human rights abuses? Uh, James Burt's uh, reference, more in sorrow than in anger, to Brexit. Now, Brexit is very relevant. You remember Ambassador Choi said, there's a constant light motif in the Human Rights Council between sovereignty of the nation state on the one hand and universal human rights and the things that bring all the nations together in, in the United Nations uh, and at the Human Rights Council. So Brexit is a case where the people of the United Kingdom by a small majority but in a very important vote, said, we don't want to be ruled by officials. We want to be ruled by politicians who are answerable to us. And uh, we uh, want to uphold the sovereignty of our country. So this is not just something theoretical. This is something that is deep. And we've got to reflect upon how that works out in the context of North Korea. Non refoulement was mentioned. Ambassador Choi, though now retired from the diplomatic service, uh, uh, had the very good manners not to mention China in referring to states that uh, perform refoulement. But um, uh, Christine Chung uh, did mention China. And China is a key to making progress. And it's important for us to recognize progress was made in the Security Council, uh, in the unanimous vote of the Security Council to impose uh, severe uh, sanctions, which, according to The Economist newspaper, are being enforced. So, um, uh, and then there was the realism lesson we got, also from Christine Chong, uh, and also from uh, other speakers. Um, the gulags survived in the Soviet Union for 18 uh, for, uh, for half a century or more, 
and there were 18 million people in them, and on a recount, none have ever been punished or rendered accountable. Now, that's a very sobering lesson for us, and a certainly uh, for the stream of our recommendations on accountability. So they're just a few items, and there will be many more, and eventually I'll dictate them, and they'll be uh, sent around, and uh, the sages will consider them. But I wanted to assure everybody who's been here today, your contribution has not been wasted. It, it will be a very good feed-in to the early work of the, um, uh, of the people who have been named as sages. And I'm very proud myself to be a a member of this uh, group, uh, and I want to pay my own respects uh, to my two colleagues, uh, Sonia Baserko, who was a magnificent uh, colleague in the COI, and who uh, kept reminding us from her background in the former Yugoslavia, Serbia, uh, of the fact that there are lessons to be learned from the way uh, that country unraveled. Uh, and uh, the way in which the issues of human rights uh, have been sorted out. So uh, I also pay my respects to Marzuki Darisman. You know, what was unique, uh, Vitit reminders, us, there were 50 co uh, commissions of inquiry of the United Nations, but there was only one COI on DPRK. And I think we did it in a different way. It was a way greatly affected by the Anglo-American principle of transparency in doing inquiries. And I think that was a, an important contribution, uh, which, as Ambassador Choi pointed out, reached out to the victims, the complainers, and reached out to media. And uh, that had its own value. Uh, uh, and uh, if there is time in securing the action on all of the recommendations, uh, the way we did it was itself a contribution to accountability. Mazuki, uh, you were magnificent, and you always reminded us getting a good report is not enough. You have to try to get follow-up and action. And uh, that reminder was a very good thing for all human rights uh, people, uh, that a beautiful report in the basement of the Palais Wilson in Geneva is not enough, and uh, the sages are going to have to try uh, within uh, their role to encourage action, not just words. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, the way clock is running, I think you'll, you'll just get one shot at this. So I will now turn to uh, Professor Muntabon, the former Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights. Dear friends, <laughs> dear people of the peninsula, dear young people, dear older people, dear everyone who's chronologically developing, those are the words of some young people at an international conference. So I'm reminded very much that there are many lessons learned from the wisdom of everyone here. And I would start off by thanking very much the opportunity, uh, thanking the hosts particularly of the opportunity to join the sages, and I will do my very best to help. Premised on the principle of, of impartiality, anchored on the promotion and protection of human rights. So there is a slight bias, of course, and that is the bias in favor of victims, in the sense that uh, it is they who have suffered, and we are here to render their tragedies, their lives more transparent with a view to accountability. In that spirit, I'd like to expand a little bit more the link between accountability and the next <coughs> steps, <coughs> particularly with a view to mobilizing the global community a little bit more through the UN and more than the UN. First of all, accountability is not just about legal accountability at all. I mean, the first 
accountability I would refer to is financial accountability. All that money spent on armed, on nuclear, on ballistic missiles would be much better spent on nurturing food, education, livelihood for the people at large in North Korea. So we ha have to emphasize that economic and financial accountability at the same time as the legal accountability that we're talking about. And it's been said already that uh, it's not just the law, it's politics, it's diplomacy, all kinds of things that come into the accountability, which opens the door to multi-tracks. It is not one entry point, but several entry points that we can explore. And let me work on five or six tracks quickly. Number one, at the multilateral level, of course the Security Council, and we know that because North Korea is not a party to the ICC statute, the only way to refer cases to the ICC is through the Security Council. And that is important, even though very difficult. Another option is an ad hoc tribunal. What is interesting with an ad hoc tribunal, if it is to be set up, is that it could actually cover a period of time looking backwards. Not just, from not just from 2002 in regard to ICC's jurisdiction, but longer back, as has been the case with many others, including Khmer Rouge Tribunal and so on. So the doors open. ICC, ad hoc tribunal, pros and cons. It's difficult to get there because you need the Security Council's blessing. But there are other elements that we should not forget. Security Council P5 should not use the veto vis-a-vis -vis measures concerning mass atrocities. That is another very important consideration. And there's been an initiative in the Security Council to invite at least voluntary compliance with that principle, which should be highlighted. They should voluntarily comply not to use the veto in regard to mass atrocities, including, by implication, referral to the ICC. And not to forget either that Security Council is not just about cross-referral to ICC. We have Chapter 7 powers, which can impose sanctions and assertive measures, and there are already sanctions against North Korea, but principally in regard to ballistic and nuclear issues, 2070 being the latest. So assertive measures on human rights matters should not be forgotten in future in the Security Council, even when they don't refer to the ICC, while not forgetting the ICC. We have Chapter 7 of the UN Charter to be well used on North Korea, better used by the Security Council. Secondly, the General Assembly. <coughs> In the latest report of our friend the rapporteur, it is noted that there was, once upon a time, a Uniting for Peace resolution adopted by the General Assembly on Korea, which said that if the Security Council is dysfunctional, the General Assembly will take charge. And it is advocated in his last report that maybe that opens the door to advocating that it's the General Assembly citing the Uniting for Peace resolution on Korea, which should expand that to possibly establish an accountability mechanism, perhaps an ad hoc tribunal, even though the Security Council won't like it very much. And by contrast, even if you don't do that, there is no harm in enabling, supporting the General Assembly to pass resolutions on accountability mm -hmm. and also to call for non-use of the veto by the Security Council on mass atrocity matters. By implication, ICC linkage too. So that's a track to be used. Thirdly, the Human Rights Council. And the next step is to have a new rapporteur together with a panel, with a group of experts on accountability. So it is an opportunity for us all here and the sages to link up. Whatever humble roadmap here, stepping stones, maybe not a roadmap, could also be useful to the pathway that may lead to a roadmap from the to-be group of experts. So let's have 
side panels in New York or Geneva when the group of experts meets, perhaps, so that we can also meet them in terms of interchange of information and ideas. There are possibilities to link up through the Human Rights Council. Fourthly, in some accountability situations, when it's not possible to go to the top of the multilateral or international level ICC, we might link up with a regional mechanism, a regional tribunal, if it exists. But it doesn't exist in Asia yet. But in Africa, you have a human rights court. And it is interesting that the Commission of Inquiry on Eritrea, submitting its latest report now, which is found crimes against humanity, committed in Eritrea, is exploring the possibility of using a regional mechanism, even if, if you don't go to multilateral ICC. And even if you don't have a regional tribunal, you do have a regional presence of the UN, happily. You have the office here, OHHR. So the cooperation there is important in terms of accountability. Information gathering, evidence gathering, and maybe ultimately sharing on the base, uh, basis of various principles. But as I said earlier, the sort of information that we would encourage collection now is primary source, victims directly, corroborated. The COI Syria, Commission Inquiry in Syria, corroborates by looking at two other sources before we use one source. And all that may ultimately lead to a list of perpetrators. Many commissions of inquiry today have submitted lists of perpetrators. Commission inquiry on Ivory Coast, which I helped with, submitted a list of perpetrators, which may one day be opened, not opened yet, if requested and blessed by the United Nations. Maybe the same one day if we work hard on evidence gathering, cross-checking, and identifying the perpetrators on the basis of fairness. Fifth, what are bilateral? Bilateral. Several countries have been affected already. Japan, South Korea, abductions and other misdeeds. You, we could have bilateral cooperation between the countries that, that have been affected and the UN or between themselves without going ultra-regional or multilateral. And we can operate on that basis, on the basis of national jurisdiction, South Korean affected by acts done by a northerner, Japanese affected by a northerner, or an universal jurisdiction. A crime anywhere is seen to be a crime here and everywhere. That could also be explored. And it is interesting that some commissions of inquiry today of the United Nations share information bilaterally with national jurisdictions. So as to help prosecute on the basis that their nationals have been affected by the misdeeds of others, the foreigners abroad, including jihadists, etc., in other situations, foreign fighters. So that is a possible avenue. And finally, the national level. Well, the national, I don't mean in South Korea so much, while you can have many actions or uh, whatever that you cited already, but the national level is back to square one. What about in North Korea one day or when the whole situation is unified? There, one day when the situation blesses possibilities, transitional justice will come into play. Truth Commission, strengthening local courts, Human Rights Commission, etc. Accountability, but more, a healing process, truth-telling, with the differentiation that there can be no amnesties for major crimes. That's an international principle. You can't amnesty crimes against humanity. The truth must come out first. And ultimately, an amnesty should not be a self-amnesty, but should come from the people, particularly through the electorate. These are all considerations that come into play in terms of a longitudinal, long-term view of accountability 
seen through a certain dynamic. And in that perspective, I would just voice again the wisdom that I learned from this morning in terms of the interlink between the stepping stones of a possible roadmap, and that is we should not forget humanitarian assistance and protection, humanitarian aid, non refoulement. We should not forget the issue of documentation, particularly on the basis of first-hand primary source information. NGOs can help us a lot to access that, but it's different methodology from some NGOs' work, of course. We should not forget investigation, prosecution, punishment, in fairness. We should not forget the traction that is needed politically and diplomatically on engagement at times, but assertive enforcement measures at times, chapter seven. And we should not forget victim centrality and civil society mobilization participation with due regard to building empathy between the young. I have visited Hang Yore School several times in South Korea, where the North Korean kids are housed. There, through community work, volunteered by many people in the system, the children from Yang Hang Hang Yore School also do social work outside the school to help others. And one of the wonderful comments I heard one day after visiting or at, at the end of the visit was, when they go out from experience, some of these youngsters from North Korea, through these activities, empathy, become some of the best social workers helping others. So nothing is, in, nothing is impossible. And what is important is to have that spirit of working together and ensuring that justice is done even if it's long term, because there can be no real peace without justice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Montabo. Ambassador King. Uh, I want to begin by thanking. Is this on? Uh, I want to begin Go by ahead. thanking uh, uh, Lee Jung Hun for his contribution both in terms of the organization of this uh, sympo symposium here today and in term <laughs> is, it, is this working? Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, organizing this symposium today, I think it's been a very useful idea uh, to get together and share the thoughts and the proposals that we've heard, and I think it's been a, a very productive time together. Uh, the other thing that he needs to be recognized for is the idea of creating this uh, group of sages. You notice he doesn't consider himself a sage. He's the executive secretary. He's the youngest one among us. Uh, but the idea of having a, a group, uh, particularly of some of the people who are here who've played such an important role in the past in terms of raising the North Korea human rights issue, I think is a particularly useful idea and particularly uh, a valuable resource that can be helpful in terms of these things. Uh, one of the things that I've sensed to some extent today and, and also in other uh, occasions when we've gotten together to talk about where we go from here in terms of dealing with North Korea and the human rights situation is some frustration, impatience, uh, and in terms of how do we move forward, how do we move forward faster. One of the advantages of age is being able to look back and see where we came from and particularly on this occasion when we have here the first of the uh, uh, UN Special Rapporteurs on North Korea Human Rights, Professor Mutaborn, and uh, Marzuki Darsman, who is the second uh, Special Rapporteur who's finishing his term, as well as the three members of the Commission of Inquiry. I think it's important to look back on what has happened over the last uh, decade plus in terms of the importance of the changes that have taken place in how we look at North Korea human rights. The first resolution that was adopted by the Human Rights Council at the time, so I think it was still called the Human Rights Commission, was adopted in 2004. We've been able to see over the last 12 years 
consistent adoption of resolutions in the Human Rights Council on North Korea human rights. We've seen the General Assembly since 2005 adopt similar resolutions, calling for change, calling for ch uh, uh, improvements in terms of the human rights situation, but also following the recommendations of the Special Rapporteurs and others, the Commission of the Inquiry, we've had the addition of uh, the creation of this office that we're commemorating here today in Seoul to gather information, to uh, carry out accountability in regard to uh, North Korea human rights. Uh, we've had uh, the discussion broadened to include the Security Council, which now for two years in a row has taken up the issue of North Korea human rights. All of these things are not f fast and dramatic, but they are progress in a forward direction that's leading towards increased emphasis on North Korea's human rights record. Uh, we reached the point the other day on the radio, they were talking about how bad the human rights situation was in Eritrea. And the comparison was, Eritrea is so bad, it is almost as bad as North Korea. This is not the kind of comment that you would have heard 10 years ago. I'm not sure you would have heard it five years ago. We have raised the profile of this issue where North Korea now is generally recognized as the worst place on the face of the earth in terms of its human rights record. This is a remarkable achievement to be able to go to where we are now. Doesn't mean that we've accomplished everything that there is to be done, but it does mean that we've made progress. A couple of things that seem to me to be important in terms of continuing this effort. Number one, one of the reasons why we've been so successful is because it has been an international effort. This needs to be seen and must be seen as a, an effort that includes nations around the world who are concerned about the severity and seriousness of the human rights in North Korea. And we need to continue that. I'm very impressed with the representatives that are serving as uh, members of the SAGES group. We have two from South Korea, but we have uh, six other countries that are represented and there's no overlap. I think that's an indication of the reason we've been successful is because this has been an international effort. And we need to continue that effort. We need to continue the involvement of other countries involved. There's no question that for South Korea, this is an issue that has a special significance. But it's also important to keep in mind that this is an issue that should be and is, I think, a concern for nations around the world. The second thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that with North Korea, the frustration and the impatience that all of us feel about the situation there and about how slowly it's moving is in spite of the fact that we're frustrated and, imp and impatient, we are making progress and we need to consistently continue the struggle. Uh, this is not something that's gonna be resolved by a resolution next week or next year. This is something that we're gonna have to continue to press on. We're going to have to continue to press the North Koreans to make progress. And we're going to have to continue to con this struggle in various United Nations forums where we've tried to raise and successfully raise this issue. So I think it's important that we continue this effort. I think in this regard, creation of this SAGES organization will be helpful in terms of moving us forward, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to use the suggestions that have been raised here today in terms of being able to find ways to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ambassador King. Sonia, you waited long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you I can wrap it all up for us. Yeah, well, I also want to join others in thanking you for uh, convening this uh, panel and this conference in general because I think it's very useful continuity that we now have uh, uh, even after the commission has finished its work. Uh, I would like to, because this morning and the panel, this panel have um, uh, commented uh, uh, what should be done in terms of international community uh, civil society, media, and so on. I would like to comment a few things uh, uh, which I really draw from my experience being a 
for 25 years uh, human rights uh, defender in, uh, in Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia. And I have participated in all these preparations for uh, international tribunals, all these measures which are considered to be the measures of transitional justice. And I must uh, come up with a little bit more realistic, um, I would say, conclusions, which, first of all, you have to arm yourself with the patience in order to deal with the, uh, facing the past uh, in North Korea, but also between the two Koreas. Secondly, it's transgenerational task. It won't happen uh, once the, this regime or however changes take place. Uh, uh, it won't take. Uh, it won't happen overnight. So you have to prepare for really uh, uh, decades ahead. Uh, thirdly, uh, it is very important how the changes will take the place in North Korea. Uh, whether they will be done inside the structures violently, and we don't know. It, it will just collapse, and uh, it will decide also uh, how the past will be treated. Fourthly, the society itself may not be ready to face the past immediately, because uh, many of them may feel humiliated and not being able to articulate all they have passed through. Secondly, they also uh, will want to change their life sooner than to be occupied with things which are relating to the past. And I think these are very important psychological moments which uh, you will be faced once the so whole process starts. So I would say uh, uh, everything that has been done now uh, uh, during the field, uh, uh, now in the, in the field office, uh, human rights uh, organizations in South Korea, international organizations, it's extremely important, first of all, in uh, uh, sort of uh, cumulating evidence or testimonies which are going to be a very important input to the narratives, future narratives of North Korea. And this, uh, uh, I think, needs a whole teams of uh, experts, scholars, who will be able to translate that in understandable uh, narratives for the younger generations to come. Uh, I think Justice is very limited, as you know, and uh, I think uh, what we really have to draw from this situation we are in now is to understand what happened and why it happened and really help young people to deal with this past in a way to understand the causes of that. And uh, you can, um, what can happen, like in our case, uh, Koreans can easily uh, go back to the Second World War or the Korean War and claim that they are victims of international conspiracy. This is what is happening in our region. Uh, and I just want to remind you that we had uh, two international courts dealing with crimes in former Yugoslavia, ICY and ICJ. We had national courts in Serbia, Bosnia and Croatia. Uh, and we had 161 people sentenced. Uh, uh, we had uh, all these uh, materials that, was, that were accumulated in the uh, ICTY, and I think this is the most important legacy of this court, but unfortunately, uh, all these judgments and this en enormous work of these uh, tribunals didn't affect societies in the region. What we have today is really regression, going back to the Second World War narratives, we are still there. So, I mean, we didn't come to the 90s. So, uh, and this may happen to North Korea, and you have to be prepared for this kind of scenario and prepare all kinds of arguments and the scenarios how to deal with that. Because uh, it is not easy. I'm living in a society which is deeply in denial. And they fabricate on a daily basis uh, <coughs> conspiracy theories which are, f I mean, falsifying. And, you know, our case was really in the light of the whole world for so long. There are so many documents. They have so many uh, films, books, uh, testimonies. And the more there is evidence, the bigger is denial. So this is also a psychological thing which you have to have in mind. Uh, secondly, I think it's uh, extremely uh, important to, at this moment, engage uh, more profoundly with certain vulnerable groups in North Korea, like women, which, uh, 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 considering the sort of um, situation now in North Korea being empowered by this marketeering, they can be, become a factor of changes. I think this is very important to deal with them in many ways through UN system, NGOs, and so on. Secondly, I think you have to prepare for the prisoners. If there are 100 prisoners in North Korea, 
Who is going to take care of them? And how are you going to handle this issue? Who is going to pay for that? Where are they going to stay? So this is a big issue. 100,000 people is not a small figure. Then you have a lot of uh, ch uh, children issue, which is uh, stunted children, uh, abandoned children in China, mm. and uh, not to mention now the China problem with the North Koreans, but uh, I th I'm talking about uh, this, um, uh, the problems inside uh, uh, North Korea itself. So I think these are all uh, possible avenues of addressing certain problems in, in waiting, I would say, for the moment when things will eventually change. And probably they will come from inside. As I understand the situation in North Korea, uh, there is internal struggle for power, and you can see it by all these out mess messages that we see and signal. The last Congress that was held recently by a young leader, it was uh, a way of uh, consolidating his power, but we don't know whether he consolidated his power. So it's, uh, there is very little known about it. Uh, so I think the major uh, interest of the North Korean people will be how to improve their lifestyles. Uh, that means the revival of economy, you know, to sort of uh, help them in the, and uh, uh, open up uh, some perspective for their future and better lives. I think this is going to be their greatest interest once it, you open up for the, any kind of changes. Secondly, I think you have to in, in, uh, engage in uh, educational reform because this is the most important uh, future-wise uh, uh, mechanism to sensitize younger people in North Korea for what, will, what was it that they went through as a society. So, uh, and one more thing, I think that all these uh, uh, societies that were under harsh pressure of the state terror, like uh, in Soviet Union, it was mentioned this morning, Romania, Albania, we didn't have serious uh, um, efforts to address the issues of the past. In, the, in, Soviet, in nowadays Russia, you had one memorial group which dealt with the de-Stalinization. In Albania, there is hardly anything. And in Romania, they killed the president, and that's how they finished the whole thing. And this is very unfortunate, because uh, uh, Putin has dismissed or marginalized the memorial group. Our current government, they declared Milosevic is a historical figure, positive connotation. We have uh, Sheshel, who was acquitted at The Hague. He is now a member of the parliament. And uh, many others who are our president, prime minister, not to mention. And as Anna has mentioned this morning, uh, security structures will be the biggest obstruction in dealing with, the, uh, in getting, obtaining the evidence. And I think the only way to deal with that, as was the case in the ICTY, is to find insiders who will provide or who will be willing to provide uh, material or testify. Uh, and what you will have to do with them is really amnesty them. This is, we had many cases, and these, are, these were the most important uh, witnesses, especially in Milosevic's case. And I would suggest that you pay attention to Milosevic's case, because there was uh, the methodology they applied in, uh, uh, in uh, highlighting the role of intellectuals, culture, uh, police, uh, army, and all this is very important for uh, us for the future. It's not now at this moment taken up seriously. It's all according to our <laughs> uh, current elites. It's a fabrication and conspiracy. But I think this should be a very important uh, foundation for the future um, how say, understanding of what has been and for North Koreans. I think South Korea has to do that. And also, I think the regional dynamics context is very important for what will happen in North Korea. You know that better than I do. With China, Japan, the countries that didn't deal with their past records at all. So you will have maybe obstructions coming from the neighboring countries as well. So, and then you have also your history with North Korea. So you have enormous agenda ahead of you. I wish you all the success, and I hope we can help as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. <coughs> It's not often we are able to um, bring together such distinguished uh, panelists at the same time. So I am going to open right away to some questions from the audience for the next, um, say, about 10 minutes. So maybe about we'll be able to entertain about five or six uh, quick uh, comments and, and questions. Please identify yourselves and try to make your question short. Yeah, uh, 오전에 질문했는데 
시스키비하고 지나갔기 때문에 다시 한번 <웃음> 질문하려고 합니다. 어, 지금 대한민국에 3만 명의 탈북민이 와 있습니다. 그런데 어, 대한민국이 입국하자마자 조사하는 국정원의 기관에서 어, 탈북자들의 인권 피해를 얼마나 조사하고 이것을 활용하고 있는지 는 우리가 모릅니다. 어, 그리고 현재 서울 유엔 사무소 직원들은 국정원 조사 이후에 트레이닝 센터 그 하나원에 나온 탈북민들을 조사하는데 네, 그러한 자료가 또 어떻게 활용될지도 우리는 이 시민 단체들은 잘 모릅니다. 그래서 어, 저는 좀 감히 좀 제안을 드리고 싶습니다. 그 세이지 현인 그룹이나 혹은 어, 이런 국제 기구에서 지난번 2013년도에 어, 서울, 도쿄, 런던, 일본에서 했던 그런 공청회를 다시 한번 한국에 있는 이 탈북민들에게 조사를 하는 것은 어떻습니까? 그래서 좀더 이런 부분에서 계획을 구체적으로 좀 세우고 탈북자들은 한국에 오면 국정원이나 하나원에서 할말다 하지 못하고 한국에 이 사회 에 정착하게 됩니다. 그 우리가 지금 캠페인이 필요하고 더 많은 자료와 수집과 증언이 필요한데 저는 정말 좋은 캠페인이 되려면 다시 한번 2013년도에 했던 그런 공청회보다 더좀더 더 조직적이고 좀더 구체적이고 좀더각 영역별로 전문가들이 좀 조사원으로 나와서 좀 해야 될 필요가 있지 않느냐 네. 어, 그런 역할이 좀 필요하지 않은데 어, 우리 어, 마루주키 다루스마님 이제 할일다 하셨으면 한국에 오셔서 해주셔도 되지 않을까 싶습니다. 감사합니다. <웃음> Professor Wang, you had a question? Thank you so much for your wonderful comment. It really got me thinking a lot, especially Sonia's point that uh, like Yugoslavia Uh, went through all this trial and then justice, but you said really didn't impact the society. Uh, what is your suggestion that we can actually learn from North Korean experience, human rights experience, that we can really improve our society in Korea, but also regional, regional uh, area? What I'm saying is uh, some in the morning, uh, one of the participants compared North Korean human rights as uh, uh, compared to the Holocaust. Uh, Holocaust, as far as I know, is a, a, a lesson for humanity. And uh, because of that, we, uh, one of the reasons why we have UDHR and all of the, uh, the more emphasis on uh, human rights. Why, in your opinion, or any, any of your uh, Excellency's opinion, why certain issues are s just become regional issues, or why certain issues become a kind of lesson for humanity that, you know, we should, and then why do you think that North Korean Human rights issues could become a lesson for humanity for moving us to next, the next step. That's just my curiosity. And if we can, uh, I would like to really see that happen uh, during this process and uh, and and even during and after unification, even forward. Thank mm -hmm. you, yeah. thank you, Ambassador. Yeah. We'll take a couple more questions and then move back to the panelists for very quick uh, responses. 예, 어, 저는 저 대구에 있는 경국대학교의 허만호 교수입니다. 어, 오늘 저 이런 뜻깊은 자리를 마련해 주셔서 주최측이나 참석자 모두 함께 에, 하나의 한국 사람으로서 또 북한 인권운동을 해온 사람으로서 대단히 감사드립니다. 어, 제가 드리고 싶은 질문은 딱두 가지인데요. 하나는요. 어, 2004년에 미국에서 북한 인권법을 만들었을 때 106조에 대해서 저는 처음부터 굉장히 주의를 기울여 왔습니다. 어, 북한 인권 문제를 에, 헬싱키 프로세스처럼 어, 다자간 다 영역에 걸쳐서 어, 논의하고 해결을 하자는 그 제안은 어, 아시아 인권 운동에 있어서도 큰 분기점이 된다고 생각합니다. 그런데 제가 몰라서 그런지 그 106조에 대해서 그 이후에 어떤 구체적인 실행 조치는 전혀 없었던 걸로 기억합니다. 그래서 여기에 대해서 어 우리 로버트 킹 대사님께서 특사님께서 어좀 설명을 해주시면 좋겠고요. 그 연장선에서 두 번째 질문은 어 
일테면 지금 그 세이즈 클럽에 중국 혹은 일본 국적의 또 저명한 인권 전문가를 초빙하면 어떨까 하는 그런 제안을 해봅니다. 이상입니다. 마 name is Casey l a r t i g I'm co-founder of Teach North Korean Refugees. I'd like to address the issue about refugees and defectors not getting involved. And I think there's a very simple but politically incorrect answer, and that is lack of money. That so many of them are unemployed. A lot of them don't have college diplomas. I think only about 7%. So I think it's unrealistic to expect a lot of them to get involved when there's no money involved. And second, a lot of the NGOs that work with them are understaffed, rely on volunteers, and they are crammed in tiny offices. So it seems that we're expecting these volunteers to act like a real army. So I think just it's a very simple answer. Thank you. There, okay, maybe final, final question. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 지금 이화여자대학교에서 북한학 박사과정 공부하고 있는 이모정 학생이라고 하고요. 어, COI 2013년 퍼블릭 히어링 할때 스태핑으로 조금 도왔던 예, 기억이 있습니다. 그 서울 오피스 이거 생길 때부터 사실 저에게 큰 기대감은 어, 그 중국도 있고 바로 옆에 인접국 일본도 있기 때문에 그러니까 서울 UN 오피스가 바로 그냥 그 디펙터스만 그냥 직접 어, gathering information만 하는 것이 아니라 어, connection with China and Japanese UN office <웃음> 이런 것들을 좀 하면 되게 좋겠다 이런 생각을 많이 했었어요. 그래서 예를 들어 실제적으로 중국에 있는 UNHCR, UNHCR 오피스에 관련을 맺어서 협의를 하면 대중 탈북자들에 대해서 난민 레피지 스테이터스를 갖는 거에 대해서 조금 더 실제적인 그런 프로세스를 추진할 수 있지 않을까 예, 그냥 우리 시민들의 NGO들의 목소리만 내는 것이 아니라 UN 대 UN 레벨에서 그런 그 커넥션이 있으면 훨씬 더 효과적으로 진행할 수 있지 않을까라는 기대감을 가졌는데 1년이 지났는데 그냥 여기서 그냥 열심히 계속 그 <웃음> 컨퍼런스 하시고 탈북자들 이제 증언 채취하고 기록하고 이런 거는 좋은데 어떤 실제적인 중국과의 연결, 중국에 있는 UN 바디와의 그런 연결들은 아직은 잘안 보이는 것 같아서 좀 그런 기대감을 예, 표출하고 싶었습니다. 네, 감사합니다. So, shall we go in reverse order? Sonia, would you like to? I think one of the questions were um, addressed to you. If you might want to, let's just make final points about two minutes each. Yeah, and we'll just go by in reverse order. <laughs> well, I may I can try to answer the question mm -hmm. by someone there about uh, North Korea becoming an example for humanity or something. I think it's necessary to contextualize the whole region because <coughs> um, there's a lot of dynamics which contributed to this position of North Korea in order then to address this uh, state terror which ended up maybe even in genocide, we don't know. So uh, it's, I think it's extremely necessary to have this regional aspect uh, of the Korean uh, problem because it's not created by Koreans themselves and uh, they are really victims hostage of the history. So this should be also explained in order to help all these people to understand what they ha have been living through. So uh, I think this, this part is extremely important and probably the whole century should be taken up, domination, Japanese domination, Second World War, uh, Korean War, and then, uh, you know, it will be also difficult to expect uh, North Koreans to accuse uh, Kim Il-sung for all these beginning decades because uh, for very long North Korea was more popular than the South and there were some modernizing uh, aspects uh, of the North Korean uh, system at the beginning. So even uh, some of the witnesses that we were talking to said that uh, everything went wrong when Kim Il-sung died. So they have to deal with that also because uh, uh, somehow uh, everything that they have now in their memory is mostly the famine years, which uh, was really the collapse of the state. And they never got back together as a state. So you have really parallel realities now, society which is struggling, struggling for survival and also elite regime which is struggling for the survival. So uh, I, I think there are so many things to be studied. And I would also recommend, I think I recommended it before, 
There is a number of their intellectuals who are enrolled, and the NED, National Endowment, published a booklet with their names and some essays. It would be extremely valuable, I think, to get, put them together so they could uh, give more profound uh, um, thinking of the, what society is. Because it's, uh, I would say society has lived and lives through corruption. Corruption is way of life, so it will be very difficult. Uh, uh, these security structures can easily point out to everyone in the system to be violating this or that uh, law. And it's really arbitrarily. You never know who will end up, uh, uh, or who may end up uh, 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 being accused. And of course, it depends whether a uh, German scenario will be possible in your case, when Western Germans overtook the East Germany, but I, I don't know. And even this scenario was very frustrating for Eastern Germans, even today. So, I mean, there are so many aspects to it, and each case is really uh, unique, but you have to study all these uh, uh, examples in order to be as much as possible informed about possible problems. Okay, thank you. Bob? Uh, the question was raised about the Mercury Human Rights Act that was passed by the United States Congress. Uh, when the act was passed in 2004, I was working for Congress and I happened to be very much involved in terms of drafting the legislation and negotiating it through the Senate and the House. Uh, what we were trying to do in the section you're talking about on the international action was try to encourage continuation of the kind of thing that had happened in 2004 with the adoption of the, re of the resolution on North Korea uh, in the uh, Human Rights Council. And so that was what that effort was. I think it's, it's been fulfilled. In fact, I think it's probably been fulfilled in spades with the uh, creation of the Commission of Inquiry and the other actions that were taken uh, in the UN Human Rights Council. But again, that emphasizes, I think, the importance of international uh, cooperation in terms of dealing with the North Korea human rights issues. Thank you. Um, just to note that um, the lesson learned, particularly from the momentum of the Commission inquiry, is that when there are so many claimed truths concerning a situation, it is important to have a UN Commission inquiry to come in to investigate and to establish the facts. That is the difference between the claimed truths coming from so many sources and the UN Blessed Commission in the middle establishing the facts as best it can from direct sourcing of evidence. That is the value added of Commission's inquiry. And it's a credit to this commission and many others as well. Secondly, another value added of this commission was and has been public hearings. The fact that victims' voices are heard. And this has been uh, an innovation that has been talked about worldwide. Bearing in mind that, of course, we have to protect the victims from reprisals with due regard to confidentiality of sources as well as consent on the part of the victims. So that's my take, particularly on the momentum which has been uh, propelled, particularly by this commission. I would just have another message in regard to North Korean, you want to call them defectors? I, I just, I'm not sure whether I like the word defectors very much, actually. Um, sometimes they're called refugees and others. They're just people uh, from a young age to an older age. And the point also is not to uh, pick upon the negative situations particularly through the media, uh, which we see here and there, but to counter that, to balance it with the more positive images with substance. Call it positive role model, if you like. My memories of the wonderful treatment of South Korea towards the North Koreans is manifested, for example, through that example of Hang Yore School, where the kids are looked after. And in reciprocity, how wonderful that the North Korean kids are also valued as contributors, as social, good social workers. So the encouragement is to enable people to be nurtured, to be respected, to be protected as people, to avoid the labeling 
and to enable the good examples to shine through and to catalyze through peer examples and through inspiring others. And my hope is that that is the way ahead and that is why we're all here together. Thank you. Michael? Um, I don't want anyone to go away thinking their questions have not been answered. Uh, number one, uh, the DPRK uh, refugees and the National Security Agency, um, we ha ha had a mandate only in respect of North Korean human rights. The, 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 Sa the SAGES group likewise is the SAGES group on North Korean human rights. A and we didn't have a mandate to inquire into uh, any human rights derogations in the Republic of Korea. And uh, as to whether Masuki Darasman could be persuaded to come back here and uh, in a private capacity take on a separate mandate, well, um, I, I think that might be awkward and difficult uh, because you wouldn't have the, the powers uh, and you wouldn't have the diplomatic immunity uh, and the way of getting the evidence uh, and so on. But it may be that what you, the question you've raised may require some consideration by the uh, SAGES group, and uh, you've made it now twice, and so we've noted it. Number two, the Holocaust. You've got to be careful using the word Holocaust. Uh, there was, there's not been nothing quite the same of the, as the organised state murder of millions of people. Uh, it had unique and special features. Genocide, uh, we dealt with in our report, um, and uh, because of the definition of genocide in the Genocide Convention, we held back from finding genocide, but we found crimes against humanity, which is a tremendously serious crime that demands action on the part of the international community. Uh, is it a lesson? I hope our report is part of the lesson for humanity. I think it would be a good thing if only our report could be published mm -hmm. in a way that was accessible uh, to people worldwide. And uh, I, I hope that that idea will be pursued because it's part of the history of the Korean people. And in due course, the Korean people will look back at this period and they will at least have the report of the Commission of Inquiry, which the United Nations set up uh, to chart that history. Uh, thirdly, refugees uh, and uh, the fact that they only 7% of them have college education, they're crammed into tiny offices. Well, I can tell you, when I was 20, 22, as a young lawyer, uh, I was working crammed into little offices for the Council for Civil Liberties in New South Wales, Australia. And I don't believe and I don't accept that the uh, people from North Korea who are here uh, will not have it in them to be concerned or be put off because they're in a tiny office. They've been used to many deprivations and insofar as they are discouraged by something, maybe national security regulations, uh, then I think a thought has to be given to how they can be allowed to flourish and to express their experience because it's out of that expression of their experience that uh, the issue uh, will be resolved in this peninsula. Finally, the question was China and Japan. Is there going to be some engagement with them? There was plenty of engagement with Japan at an official level and at a personal lever level. We did ask to go to China. The answer was no. We did ask to go to Beijing to speak to the academies and to the office of the High Commissioner of for refugees? The answer, very respectful and courteous, was no. We did ask to go to the north uh, east areas of China where there's a large refugee population and ethnic Korean population. The answer was no. And so I think it is necessary to mention the word China, human rights uh, position of China, because China is a clue to the solution that will ultimately resolve the issues on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Final. Well, I, I have nothing to <laughs> add <laughs> since uh, Michael Kirby's answer was so <laughs> comprehensive. <laughs> 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 but uh, 
One thing to add, if I might, uh, is that uh, since the, uh, the, uh, this human right uh, issue in North Korea is so important that it shouldn't be uh, mainly left to uh, the NGOs, internal or, or external. Uh, I would uh, respectfully, respectfully submit that the Korean government um, should take more initiatives and double their efforts for uh, uh, adequate preparation uh, of ourselves uh, for, uh, for whatever uh, may, might happen in, in, in North Korea. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I would like to um, bring to a conclusion uh, this panel by uh, reading out um, <clears throat> seven recommendations uh, prepared in advance um, as, as the first recommendations coming from the SAGES group. It will not be the, uh, the, it will not be the last, there will be more. Uh, it is the first, so it may not be perfect. Um, so let me, let me just uh, read them off uh, to you. The recommendations of the SAGES group on North Korean human rights. Number one, in the name of humanity and universal human rights, the SAGES group calls on the government of the DPRK. They're not translating? Isn't it being translated by the translators? Yes. Mm -hmm. It'll have to go slower. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Two, two pages. Sorry. It's all right. Let me, let me start over. Recommendation number one. In the name of humanity and universal human rights, the SAGES group calls on the government of the DPRK to take immediate steps to comply with the recommendations made in the report of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK, published in February of 2014. Action is necessary both in respect of the recommendation on accountability and in respect of opening up respectful engagement. It is high time for assertive action. Recommendation number two. In view of the lack of progress in improving the human rights situation in the DPRK, and given the urgent need to highlight to the relevant conditions such as the continuing existence of the political prison camps, the persecution of persons on the ground of their religious belief, and the impasse on the victims of abduction, as well as the separated family problem, the SAGES group, deeply concerned joins in the international calls for a stronger United Nations commitment and action to break the present deadlock, including effective implementation of United Nations Security Council resolution, such as the recent resolution 2270. Recommendation number three, the SAGES group urges the Security Council to refer the situation in the DPRK to the International Criminal Court for action in accordance with the Rome Statute in the hope of delivering a clear message to the DPRK as to just how seriously the human rights issue is viewed by the United Nations. At a minimum, the Security Council should immediately 
establish a committee or task force to study and report on the utility and the effects of an ICC referral and other related matters. Recommendation number four. The SAGES group expresses added concern over the new evidence since the report of the Commission of Inquiry regarding the appalling conditions of the North Korean overseas laborers, including those in countries that have ratified the Rome Statute. Where violations of fundamental labor rights are established, such as protection from forced labor and of freedom of association, the states within which the North Korean laborers work have obligations under international law to investigate, to call for improvement, and finally, to take action against such unlawful practices. Recommendation number five. The SAGES group warmly welcomes all diplomatic and cultural efforts that could help to make a difference, provided that such efforts do not conflict with or undermine the international sanctions already in place designed to bring about positive results on the part of the DPRK. Recommendation number six. The SAGES group notes with congratulations the first anniversary of the establishment of the OHCHR Seoul office and while respecting its mandate and independence promises to provide all possible support to the work of that office. And finally, recommendation number seven. The next meeting of the SAGES group will be held in New York later in 2016, this year, while the United Nations is in session. The group will continue to appeal to the con conscience of humanity, which will never be at peace until there is justice and accountability for the crimes of the DPRK and the peace engagement of the DPRK with its neighbors. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the first of many more recommendations to come. The SAGES group will not just make recommendations, but we will put all our concerted efforts to the best of our ability to make good on these recommendations. So thank you all for attending the whole day. Could we please give a warm round of applause for not only the current panels, but all those who participated in the earlier sessions as well. Thank you.